Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's dive in. Um, this is where we are and this is where we're going. We're working our way through a relatively short history of this relatively recent field. We looked at a few initial experiments. And then last time, we prepared to talk about minimal cognition. And in the minimal cognition experiments, uh, all the robots we're going to talk about today and Tuesday are uh, using evolved CTRNNs, continuous time recurrent neural networks, which is a bit of a mouthful. Continuous is reminding us that the values of the neurons are continuously uh, changing over time. Recurrent, uh, all the neurons are connected to all other neurons, including themselves, so they are self-connections. What do recurrent and self-connections confer to the neural network and onward to the robot? What's the benefit of having recurrent and self-connections? We saw some recurrent connections when we looked at the gantry robot last week. Being able to remember what you've seen in the past. Being able to remember what you've seen or sensed in the past, or what you did in the past. And that'll become very important when we talk about the minimal cognition experiments today in lecture nine. Okay, we're probably gonna finish lecture nine today and move on to lecture 10, and we're gonna look at um, one of the most interesting experiments in evolutionary robotics, which is training a robot to perform active categorical perception, or ACP. We'll get to that uh, hopefully today. Okay, before we dive back into lecture, any questions about assignment five? We're doing housekeeping this week, cleaning things up, refactoring, making your code modular, also help you remind where all the various pieces are going and prepare us for uh, assignment six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and your final project. All good? Okay, all right. So lecture nine, uh, minimal cognition. This is one of my most favorite lectures of the semester. We're gonna look at four different building blocks of uh, intelligence today. And we're gonna look at, uh, from the point of view of the investigators that did this work, what is the simplest robot you can make with the simplest neural network and an evolutionary algorithm, which is a relatively simple way of training a robot, what is the minimal simplest thing we can make in which we evolve robots that exhibit the beginnings of four building blocks of intelligence? We talked in the beginning of the course about how it's very difficult to define intelligence. I've been to dozens of AI conferences that degenerate into arguments about what intelligence is, what it isn't, what's consciousness, what's free will, what's decision making, what's planning. We're gonna try and get rid of all of that argument, arguing in the cloud and ground our discussion, our investigation of intelligence by actually designing robots that do X, then do X plus Y, then do X plus Y plus Z, more and more of the building blocks of intelligence, where it becomes more and more difficult for us as an observer, as an external observer, to point at it and say, it isn't intelligent. Whatever it's doing, it's certainly acting as if it's intelligent, as if it is making decisions, as if it is planning, and so on. Okay, so what you're going to see in lecture nine now looks very different from what you may have seen in deep, uh, deep learning classes or traditional AI. Very, very different approach to trying to create intelligent machines. So as promised, uh, we're going to look at four building blocks of intelligence and the citation at the bottom right there, these, four, uh, these are four experiments taken from one research paper. I'm going to start with the first of four, which is the ability to perceive affordances. Who's taken a psych class and heard of affordances before? A couple people. Okay, all right. Affordances is an idea that comes from uh, psychology, and we're actually going to see affordances several places throughout this course. Affordances is a hypothesis about how organisms, and in particular how humans, see the world. If I were to ask you to define what a chair is, usually you would give me back a geometric description. A chair has a flat surface, it has four legs, or maybe three legs, or maybe one leg. It's got a relatively flat back. You give a geometric interpretation. At the beginning of AI, in the, uh, maybe starting in the 60s and 70s, when they were first starting to create computers that could classify images, there is a chair in this photograph, or there isn't, the investigators assumed the definition of a chair is geometry. So they built feature detectors into the AI to try and recognize flat seats, vertical legs, a flat back, and so on. Thinking about thinking is misleading. 
The hypothesis behind affordances is that what you're really doing when you look around your environment and you're trying to make sense of what you see is you're not necessarily analyzing the geometric properties of what you see, or at least that's not the only thing you're doing. You are also thinking about how you might interact with that object. You are a part of understanding your world. So affordances is the idea that objects, in a sense, project an advertisement or they afford a suggestion of how they can be used by the observer. That is the underlying, that, that is the underlying way in which we make sense of our world. So I picked five images here, which maybe, I don't know about the fifth one, but you could argue these are more or less chairs. And I picked them on purpose because they have completely different geometric properties. This is why image classification is so difficult. If we provide an AI just with photographs, that's all it has is geometric properties. Okay, so an affordance, the formal definition here, which we'll just take from Wikipedia, it's good enough for our purposes. An affordance is a quality of an object, something that it emits or gives off, that allows an individual, the observer, to perform a particular action with it, right? So again, we're back to embodied cognition. When you look at everything that's, go that's out there in the world, you're thinking about how or whether you may be able to interact with it, right? So what do all these objects have in common? It's hard to find a geometric feature that they all have in common. What's common about them is they all afford, or they all project the affordance of sitability. So when we're talking about uh, when we're talking about affordances, we're going to talk a lot about adverbs, sit ability. It's something that you could sit on. Okay. Here's another set of objects. I've kept one of these objects in common because, of course, objects can proje project different affordances. There are different ways we can interact with the things that exist out in our world, and the particular affordance that we tend to focus on is modulated or directed by lots of other things going on. In this case, other objects that are around this tree stump. What do these all objects have in common? What's the affordance that's projected by these? As an energy source, right? So they're burnable or they're translatable into useful energy. What's the affordance being given off by this object? You can write with it, most obvious one, right? Remember our discussion about joint normals? What's the affordance of these two objects now? Movement, Movement they're, they're being used for teaching a, a concept. Obviously, lots of different affordances that immediately change where, depending on context. So as always in this class, when class ends and you go about your normal day today, pay attention to all the things that you see around you. And if you think to yourself, okay, that's a door because dot, 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 before today you would probably give a, you would probably give a geometric description of a door. It's more or less rectangular. Uh, uh, it's on the side, of, it's in a wall inside of a room. I want you to think about all of these objects and think about the affordances that they're projecting. What are they advertising to you as you go about your day? And some of those objects, which you may encounter multiple times throughout the day, they may uh, project different affordances to you, depending on what you're doing at that particular point in time. Okay. Again, it's a hypothesis. It's not really obvious how we exactly recognize that these are chairs and these are energy sources. But we're going to proceed on, uh, on the hypothesis that it's useful for us and also for machines as they scan their environment to be able to interpret how objects can be used relative to the observer, where in a moment the observer is going to be not us, but the robot. Okay. So let's talk about the little cartoon in the top left. As promised, we're going to try and create as minimal a robot as possible. So here's our little Space Invaders robot. It's a square, and it can move left and right along the bottom of the screen. What do you think the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven gray beams are that are emanating out from our little agent here? 
It's the sensors, it's the field of view of the robot. So this particular robot has seven proximity sensors. So at every point in time, the CTRNN that is controlling this robot is gonna, seven of the neurons inside that CTRNN, each is gonna receive one number, uppercase I sub I. Each of those seven neurons is gonna receive one number, which is the length of this beam. So you can see at this particular point in time, uh, sensors two and four and five are receiving, uh, are, are reporting slightly lower values than one, three, six, and seven. Seven sensors. T two other neurons in the CTRNN are tagged as motor neurons. So the values arriving at those two neurons are being sent to two little rockets on the left and right of the robot. And those two numbers are now being interpreted as, as the force of the rocket. So a large left value is uh, firing the left rocket, pushing the robot to the right. And the other value is the amount of force that the right hand rocket is applying, pushing the robot to the left. So as you can see with the little black arrows there, it's moving back and forth along the bottom of the screen. Two-dimensional, very simple, seven sensors, two motors. The environment for this robot is also pretty minimal. From time to time, we're gonna drop a pair of objects from the top of the screen, and that pair of objects, we're gonna assume those objects are connected. They're gonna to fall together at a constant velocity towards the bottom of the screen. We're gonna try and evolve a robot that can perceive affordances. And it's going to, we're gonna try and evolve the CTRNN to get the robot to perceive a particular affordance, which is whether this pair of blocks is passable or not. So the magic adverb for this experiment is passability. What does passability mean? Uh, we're gonna drop pairs of objects and some of those pairs are gonna have a wider or narrower aperture between them. The robot's task is to determine as the object pair is falling, is the gap wide enough for the robot to pass between the two objects? If it is, the robot should situate itself under the pair of blocks and allow either block to fall on either side without touching it. It should pass through this object pair. If the gap is too narrow, is narrower than the width of the robot, the robot should move, should run away. It should detect the affordance that that object pair is impassable and act differently. So our robot can't speak. It can't tell us whether this object pair is passable or not. It's gonna speak with action. If it knows that it's passable, it's gonna try and pass between the objects. If it detects that it's impassable, it's gonna try and move away. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, the fitness function, which in this case, they use P for performance. Performance fitness doesn't really matter for our purposes. We're gonna try and evolve populations of CTRNNs that maximize P. And P, as you can see, is a summation over num trials. So for every evolved CTRNN, we're gonna drop N trials uh, object pairs. So we're gonna evaluate every CTRNN num trials times. And we're gonna compute the average performance uh, of each of those passes. So P sub I is gonna be the performance of the robot in the ith trial. Okay, uh, this is the first time we've seen a conditional fitness function. So we're going to assign points, performance points, depending on uh, the robot's uh, environment. So in the first case, uh, if the opening is too narrow, so if the, the, uh, the distance between the pair of objects is narrower than uh, the robot's width, we're gonna apply this fitness function. And if the aperture is wide enough for the agent to pass between, we're gonna use this fitness function. Let's start with this one here. So the opening is too narrow. We're going to try and maximize, uh, we're gonna try and maximize the absolute value of D. I'm not, I think there's a couple of errors in this paper. This is distance, so I don't think we need to take the absolute value of a distance because distance is always positive. If the aperture is too narrow, we're trying to maximize the distance between the horizontal position of the robot and the horizontal position of the object pair when it gets to the ground, right? Best thing you can do if you detect that the object pair is impassable is get as far away from the object pair as possible. Make sense? Okay. 
If the aperture is wide enough, if it's passable to pass through, there are three possible situations. There's definitely an error in this paper, so I've amended it here. There's actually three conditions. So if the object pair is passable and the robot runs away, if it's beyond the blocks, it gets zero points. It did the worst possible thing. It ran away when it should have tried to thread the needle, should have tried to pass between the object pair. It gets the maximum number of points, 100, if it moves so that it's right underneath the object pair and both objects fall on either side and neither of those objects collide with the robot. This third case is if the robot gets hit by one of the objects. So it neither ran away nor managed to thread the needle. It gets hit. And at the moment it gets hit, we, we calculate d sub i, the horizontal distance between the agent and the center of the object pair. Are we penalizing for distance or rewarding for distance in this case? Penalizing. We're penalizing, right? So it got hit, and the further away you were when you got hit, the worse it is. So if one CTRNN causes the robot to, got, to get hit, and it has a large D sub I, it's relatively far from the center of the object pair, a second CTRNN also causes the robot to get hit by the object pair, but that robot is a little bit closer towards the center of the object pair. There's less of a penalty for this uh, second CTRNN. It has a higher probability of producing randomly modified copies of itself. Pretty straightforward. So far, so good? Okay. Okay. So uh, they ran evolution, they evolved a bunch of CTRNNs, and throughout this experiment, one of the things that's interesting about uh, this paper is they went into quite a bit of detailed analysis of the evolved solutions. Not surprisingly, this paper was published, so they clearly were able to evolve a robot that uh, succeeds at this task, but how does it succeed at this task? They took the CTRNN with the highest fitness after evolution had concluded, and they played back that CTRNN many, many times, hundreds, thousands of times. They took that single evolved CTRNN, put it back in the agent, and dropped all kinds of different object pairs to see how that evolved CTRNN did. They dropped on the horizontal axis here, they dropped object pairs that had an aperture width that was four times as wide as the width of the agent. They dropped object pairs in which the aperture was four times narrower than the object width of, uh, of the agent's width, and they dropped object pairs in which the distance between the objects was exactly the width of the robot's body. How did the robot do under all these different conditions? Or what did the robot do under all these different conditions? Wider apertures, narrower apertures, apertures that are just wide enough, So the vertical axis is reporting how that CTRNN did for that particular pair of objects. What was the horizontal distance between the robot when controlled by this evolved CTRNN when the object pair actually got to the ground? How did the robot do? Did it constantly run away? Not always, some of the time. So let's, let's, take a particular, let's take a particular case here. Let's go all the way to the left. So in this case, they were dropping object pairs, which were very, very close to one another. The distance between the, distance between the pair of objects was uh, minus four, uh, four units narrower than the width of the agent's body. There's no way the agent can get between them. What does, does the agent do in those cases? What does little Space Invaders agent at the bottom of the screen do? Runs away. It runs away, right? So wherever the object pair is, as it falls towards the bottom of the screen, on average, the robot was 40, uh, was 40 length units away from that object pair. I should have probably said this earlier. Uh, what's important here is that What's important here is not the absolute distance, sort of an arbitrary unit of distance, like in PyroSim. Could be inches, could be meters, doesn't really matter. 
The robot was 40 units horizontally away from the object pair when the object pair hit the ground. It ran away. Let's go to the other extreme here. In this case, there's an object pair that's falling, and the, uh, the width between the object pair is four times the width, uh, uh, sorry, four units wider than the width of the agent. Plenty of room. What does the agent do in this case? It goes in between the blocks. So on average, the horizontal distance between the robot and the object pair when it gets to the ground is zero. Did the right thing. Sounds good. What happens as we start to move in to this middle region of the plot here? What's happening when the aperture is just a little bit wider or just a little bit narrower than the width of the agent? It doesn't really know what to do. So these uh, tall vertical bars here, these are error bars. So what they're representing is we actually, the investigators actually drop multiple pairs of objects from different positions at the top of the screen. And they all had, whatever that is in this case, 0.2, they were 0.2 units wider than the width of the agent's body. Just a little bit wider, just enough for the robot to get through. And the mean distance, between the robot under these conditions was 20 units. Most of the time it ran away, even though the aperture was a little bit wider than the width of the agent. Could have made it if it tried, but it, it tried not to. Sometimes it did go for it, and sometimes it didn't. What did it do when the aperture width was exactly the width of the agent's body? At zero here, the relative aperture, aperture width is zero. Exactly the same width as the agent's body. Uh, the agent ran away from both spots. Makes sense, right? So this agent is a little bit conservative. If it's not, quote unquote not quite sure, it runs away. Probably a good thing to do, right? Generally speaking, for robots and for organisms that are evolved, better to err on the side of caution most of the time, right? OK. All right. Let's dive down and look at a little bit more, uh, let's look in a little more detail about what exactly this particular CTRNN is causing this robot to do. This figure and uh, this, uh, these figures we're gonna talk about, this is analysis of just a single, single evolved CTRNN. Yeah? Okay, let's start up here. So in this upper left panel here, this is going to represent um, object pairs that are dropped from the top of the screen where, uh, where the aperture is one unit narrower than the agent's width. So these all correspond to object pairs that are impassable. Uh, the way to read this is we're going to start at the top of this figure and uh, here that represents the start of the simulation. So on the vertical axis, we have vertical position, the height of the object pair. The horizontal axis here represents the horizontal position between the object pair and the agent. So if we go to the top left of this panel, the coordinate here is about minus 40 for x and 140 for y. This means that they dropped an object pair 40 units to the left of the robot. The robot is at the bottom of the screen. The object pair is at the top of the screen. The object pair is dropped 40 units to the left of the robot. And the object pair starts falling vertically. Over here in the top right of this panel, the object pair is dropped at a height of 140. And it's dropped 40 units to the right of the agent. So far, so good. So we're, pl we're playing back, or we're letting this evolve CTRNN control this robot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, however many lines there are on this plot. That's how many times they played back this evolved CTRNN. They wanted to see what the CTRNN would do with the robot when this slightly impassable aperture appears at various positions above the robot. The actual drawing of the curve, you can see that as the objects are dropping, so as we move from the top towards the bottom of this panel, the object pair is falling. 
and the horizontal position is also changing. The object pair always falls straight down. It's the, object, it's the agent that's moving left and right and changing the horizontal position between the agent and the object pair. Wherever you see vertical lines, that means that the agent isn't moving. The horizontal distance between the object pair and the agent is staying constant. When you see a diagonal line, that means the agent is moving. Can everybody see this now? Everyone see how to read this figure? Okay. What is the what is the C tier and N cause the agent to do under these 30 odd conditions? The agent doing the right thing, the wrong thing? How do we know? Does the robot choose to try and thread the needle in this impassable case or run away? Run away. Runs away. How does it run away? This figure told us that generally it runs away when the object pair is impassable. This figure tells us a little bit more about how the agent runs away. It seems like once the box reaches a, a height of falling at 60, the agent goes right underneath and looks at the distance between the two, and then it determines that it's um, not passable, so then it runs away. That's what it looks like, right? So something is happening around a height when the object pair gets to a height of about 60 units. In all cases, the robot seems to have moved underneath the agent pair at that time. You can see all these lines are converging on a, a horizontal position of zero. The agent is getting underneath this object pair, and then in half of the cases, it runs away to the left, and in half of the cases, it runs away to the right. Everybody see that? Great, this aligns with our intuition. The robot waits scans, makes a decision at a height of 60, and decides which way to go, left or right. Right? It's obvious. Great, it's intuitive in this case. Okay, you should all know enough from this course that that's definitely not what's happening. Thinking about thinking is misleading. Let's keep going. We're gonna take the same CTRNN, we're gonna play it back another 30 or so times, this time, we're going to draw pairs of objects from the top of the screen at different horizontal positions at the top of the screen. And in this case, the uh, aperture is one length unit wider than the width of the agent. What does the agent do? What does the CTRNN cause the agent to do in these cases? Move to the middle and then hopefully pass through. So you can see in all these cases, between about a height of 40, by the time the agent pair gets to a height of 40 and then drops below a height of 40, the robot is staying completely still and waiting for the object pair, to, the pair of objects to fall on either side of it. If you look at the shape of these curves above 60 units and the shape of the curve above 60 units, in this case as well, they look almost exactly the same. What does that tell, what's going on here? The, the robot might be moving to left and right because the agent is taking two of the two objects and the two of the two. Po yeah, possibly. So it's maybe scanning these objects and sort of gauging, uh, sort of sweeping its whiskers, so to speak, sweeping its sensors underneath the under uh, sides of these objects to try and decide what to do. It's possible, right? So uh, the investigators don't actually give a distance, uh, don't give details, but the sensors are definitely longer than, than 60. So the robot can quote unquote see this object pair above, before, uh, long before the, the object pair drops to a height of 60. It seems to be kind of ignoring its sensory information at this time. It's doing more or less the same thing in both cases, regardless of whether the aperture is wider or narrower than the agent. The difference only kicks in around a height of 60. It looks to all intents and purposes as if this robot is looking and then deciding and doing something at exactly this point in time. Remember that this, is, this C tier and N has recurrent and self-connection. So the robot can have a memory. It can remember what it's seeing 
as it's sweeping the bottom of these objects with its sensors. We can't conclude that it makes its decision at exactly this point in time. You might remember the Libet experiment from the 1980s we talked about a few weeks ago, where it seemed blindingly obvious to all the human subjects that they made a decision at this point in time, and neural science and uh, scans of their brain and their fingers showed that whatever they were doing, they definitely did not make the decision at that point in time. They made a decision earlier. So we can't conclude just from the way the robots are moving that they made a decision at this point in time. The gantry robot also reminds us that saying they made a decision, that there's some neuron that suddenly flicks into a, a high state or a low state at a given point in time. We do, it's not even clear what it means to make a decision or what it, what it means for a CTRNN to make a decision. All we can do is look at what, how the robot is moving. So far, so good? Okay, let's look at the last picture here. Same evolved CTRNN. In this case, every single pixel in this plot represents one trial with this evolved CTRNN. The height of the pixel represents the relative aperture width. So all the pixels that are in the top half of this picture correspond to trials in which the aperture was wider than the width of the agent. All the pixels in the bottom half of this picture represent trials in which the aperture width was narrower than the width of the agent. All pixels on the left half of this figure correspond to trials in which the object pair was dropped above and to the left of the robot. And all pixels in the right half of this picture correspond to trials in which the object pair was dropped above and to the right of the agent. So far, so good. So there's thousands and thousands of pixels in this image, so that we're looking at thousands and thousands of trials with this single evolved CTRNN. The grayscale of each pixel represents the performance. How well did the robot do? If the pixel is right, if the pixel is white, it means that the robot did the correct thing in that case. If the aperture was impassable, the agent ran away. If the aperture was passable, the agent threaded the needle. It went between the object pair. All of the pixels that are colored uh, gray here, one, one of the objects hit the robot. It neither ran away nor managed to thread the needle. So in both, case, in both cases, passable or impassable, if the agent gets hit, we know immediately it's doing the wrong thing. It didn't run away and it didn't try and thread the needle. Black pixels represent it did absolutely the worst thing. It ran when it should have stayed, it ran when it should have thread, threaded the needle, or it tried to thread the needle when it should have run away. Give you a minute for that to sink in. Everyone see how to read this figure now? Okay. There's uh, lots we can tell about this particular CT, CTRNN from this picture. What are, some, what are some messages you can take away from this evolved, uh, from this figure? It did really well when it needed to run away to make sure like, the relative width was narrower. Yep, yep, absolutely, right? So the bottom half of this figure is all white. So generally speaking, when the aperture was impassable, it ran away, right? Which kind of reinforces this picture. This agent is, generally speaking, kind of conservative. It's a little bit of a, a Frady cat, like a vehicle 2A, right? Its tendency is to run away if it's not sure. Probably a pretty good thing to do. What about what's going on in the top half of this figure? Yep. Uh, was decision making was symmetric regardless of the type of the block and dialogue? Yep, great, great observation, right? So whatever's going on in the CTRNN, it's more or less symmetric. Good observation. What else is going on here? We want to pay particular attention, obviously, to the gray, and in particular, the black pixels, where it's doing the wrong thing. Imagine this is a trained control policy for an autonomous car. It does the right thing 99% of the time. You want to understand what the heck is going on in the 1% of the cases where it does the wrong thing. It seems like when the aperture is like like it's, it's a narrow margin, it's a lot dark, like darker pixels by that line. 
Okay, so that makes sense, right? So if we draw a line down the, uh, the midline of this figure, that's when the aperture is exactly the same width as the agent or a little bit wider, or a, li a little bit wider, a little bit narrower. What's happening at exactly, uh, or I'm sorry, in the midline here, this is cases where the pair of objects is dropped directly above the agent. That's what the midline here, rep the vertical midline represents. What's happening in that case? It's, it's always running away. This black streak here represents the robot is running away. It's running away when the aperture is wide enough in the upper half of this figure. Actually, it's even running away when the aperture is three units wider than the width of the agent. This should be a no-brainer. It should absolutely try and thread the needle, and it doesn't. It runs away. What is going on here? Anybody have any idea? Oh, the, the sensors it's using are diagonal, so my assumption is that the farther away it is, we're going to get less sensors right in between the two blocks, and so it's going to assume that it's a smaller gap. Whereas if you had it straight up horizontal vectors of sensors, it would be much better to detect. Okay. It's a good guess, not quite. If you look very carefully at the sensors here, there are seven of them. It's an odd number. The middle one is pointing directly up. So in this case here, the object pair is placed directly above the robot, and the fourth sensor is pointing directly up through, through the gap. So it's not that it can't see this very wide gap. Anybody have a guess what might have happened? Why is this evolved CTRNN failing, failing particularly badly under this condition? What do you mean by the position needs to be dead on exact? I guess even if it's wide enough, there's still a margin of error in just giving it the size of the block. Okay, there's a bit of a margin of error here. Do you have an idea? Well, um, maybe you could push it like it has, it feels like it has to move. Okay. So uh, it, like, it doesn't trust it to stay still. Okay. So it could just fall like the block. That's a great observation. So it's possible that this particular CTRNN during the evolutionary process, quote unquote, hit on the solution, that it makes sense to wave its sensors back and forth, brush the undersides of the objects. Remember the gantry robot, we saw exactly that. When it was trying to distinguish between triangles and rectangles, that particular neural network could not distinguish between triangles and rectangles until it moved. It was relying on movement and timing and darkening of pixels. Maybe the same thing's going on here. Is it like hedging its bets with like the, the, the fitness function? Because like if it's right in between blocks the maximum number of points, but it can still get a lot of points if, the, if it hits with a distance of three like, slightly. Yeah, true, it could be that it just allows itself to be hit, but these pixels are black, meaning it didn't even get hit. It actually ran so far away that it didn't even get hit by the objects. So we're focusing at the moment. The gray pixels, you're right. These are all the cases where it's being hit. It didn't manage to thread the needle, even though the aperture was more than wide enough for the agent to pass between. If, you look, if we go back for a moment, you look at all of these object pairs that are dropped. These are actually the conditions that were used during evolution. Remember that for every CTRNN during evolution, it was exposed to, it was evaluated num trials times. These are those num trials. These are all the conditions in which the object pairs were dropped above the robot. What's going on? It never trained on anything in the middle. You'll see it. The, when the investigators just set up this experiment. I doubt they did this on purpose. It just happened that during evolution, a CTRNN never saw an object pair at height 140 and directly above itself. It never saw that condition before. And unfortunately, that means that when, after evolution, when we expose it to an environment it's never seen before, a passable object pair directly overhead fails. This is what keeps AI researchers uh, up at night, right? 
We train, uh, we train an autonomous car to drive perfectly well for 30,000 miles, 300,000 miles. We put it out on the actual road with actual human beings, and that autonomous car senses a particular situation that it never saw during training before. What will that agent do, or what will that autonomous car do? At the moment, nobody in AI has any way to guarantee they will do more or less the right thing. Another billion dollar question in AI. How do we guarantee that a trained robot or AI uh, artifact will generalize well to unseen conditions? Here's a minimal example of an agent not doing that. Most of the pixels here are white. So even in conditions it hasn't seen before, most of the time it's doing the right thing. In a minority of cases, it's doing not quite the right thing. It's getting hit by the block. And there are some cases where it's doing the wrong thing. What can you tell me about this horizontal band of black? What is that telling you about this particular evolved CTRNN? I've got a question. When you sure. Like it's doing the wrong thing because yep. it's running away when it could get through if it's technically, like, here's a different question, but not getting the maximum point, but it seems it's being conservative if it's considered like. Ah, great question. Okay, that's a great question. So it ran away when the, ob when, the, when the object pair was passable. Did it do the right thing or the wrong thing? From the point of view of the fitness function, it's doing the wrong thing. We were trying to evolve agents that whenever the object pair is passable, you should pass through it. But being conservative, if you're not quite sure between trying to thread the needle and running away, Maybe, on average, the best thing is to do is to run away. From a human perspective, not necessarily a fitness function, that kind of feels like the right thing. This, is an, this brings up another problem in AI and robotics, which is the, eva the uh, value alignment problem. So we have the fitness function, and then we have a human being that says, if you're not sure, run away or kind of do the safe thing. Don't do anything dangerous. That's kind of a human value, generally speaking, right? So fitness functions, whatever we're using to train the AI, it doesn't always, in retrospect, align or line up with human values. How do we get, how do we get an agent, how do we get an AI or a robot to align its values with ours? Again, a completely open question in AI and robotics. Great, great observation. So this horizontal band of black just above relative aperture width of zero means if the aperture width is just a little bit wider than the agent, generally speaking, it runs away. From the human point of view, maybe that's a good thing, but from the fitness function, it says, uh-uh, that was the wrong thing. So, um, can the robot distinguish between, like, uh, like, can it remember when it's at a certain height? Like, it's been at a certain position at that uh, initial, or not the initial horizontal position, but a horizontal position of zero in okay. other trials. So can it not remember that when it's at that horizontal position, like if, if it just stays stationary, it'll pass between two objects? In theory, it could remember that, right? If I'm directly underneath the object pair and my sensors report whatever values they report that says that the, the width is wide enough for me to get through, I should just stay still, which is, Generally speaking, what it does when the aperture width is wide enough. So it should, in theory, be able to remember that in all cases, but in this case, it doesn't. It, remember, it, it does that in most cases, but not every case. Make sense? Yeah, I'm just curious why it doesn't do that. In oh, because it, it never saw that condition before. It never saw the condition where the object was higher than 60, the object pair was was higher than 60, and it was directly overhead. Right. So if you look in this, this gap here at the top in both panels, this is showing you what the robot, this CTRNN experienced during evolution. It never saw passable or impassable object pairs that were 140 units directly above. It's seen them directly above uh, at this point, at a height of 100 and also a height of 60, but not the other cases. So there's situations here in time and space that it's experiencing down here 
that it never experienced during evolution. Everybody see that? I think there was, was there one more question? Yep. It also looks like when it starts, Yep. So if you actually trace some of these trajectories, they kind of do weird things, right? So the objects are way to the left. The robot starts moving to the left, goes underneath the object pair, stays still for a while, and then keeps going in the other direction, right? So there's kind of idiosyncratic behavior going on here. So <clears throat> if, uh, if the robot like defaulted to like this forward movement, like wouldn't it eventually get like kind of caught in the net? So like when it's at a hundred, so it starts at one forty and it's directly in the center. Okay. So as it approaches it and it reaches like one hundred, wouldn't it have seen that situation? Yes. So it's seen it's seen object pairs that are directly above at a height of one hundred, but it has not seen object pairs that are directly above above 100. It's never seen that situation. So we have no idea what the robot is going to do under, under those conditions. Actually, now we know it's going to do this. So is it like just making the decision too early? Ah, who knows? Is it making the decision too early? We don't know when it's making the decision, right? It's Whatever it's doing, it's not making the decision at 60 because if it was making the decision at a height of 60, it wouldn't have mattered what it saw before that. But this picture is telling us that it definitely does. When the object is at a height of 140 and it's directly overhead, the robot does the wrong thing. I mean, I guess it starts running away immediately. It would be in the case of 15 seconds it had no time to do it. Yep, exactly, exactly. So we have indirect evidence here that whatever it's doing, as always, it's not the intuitive thing. It's not waiting. It's not moving such that everything looks the same. It's saying, okay, I'm, the object pair is at a height of 60. I'm underneath. In every single trial, this C tier and N got under, directly underneath the object pair when the object pair was at a height of 60. At that point, in theory, it should be able to just see and say, okay, the gap is passable. I'm going to stay where I am. Or the gap is impassable. I'm going to run away. Seems intuitive, looks from these two pictures like that's what's going on, but the failure down here says whatever it's doing, it's not doing that. It's quote unquote making a decision earlier, or maybe it's making gradual decisions continuously up until a height of 60, who knows? Hard to say. Okay, all good? This is what I love about this lecture. We could spend all day talking about just this one evolved C turn in this very specific case. All right, let's, let's move on. We're going to look at four uh, building blocks of cognition today. We just looked at affordances. If you want to survive out there in the world, you've got to be able to distinguish friend from foe, food from poison, and so on. The way you do that is not always just by looking at geometric properties. It's trying to reason about how you can interact with external objects. Another challenge you need to overcome in order to grapple with the world, one of the first problems you need to solve is to distinguish self from non-self. Where have we seen this before? We've actually seen a robot that already grappled with this issue. Baby bot. Baby bot, exactly, right? There's this moving blob in front of me, and whenever I stop sending commands to my motors, that blob disappears. Oh, there it is again. Now we're going to see, BabyBot is extremely complicated. BabyBot now lives in the Boston Science Museum. You can go check, uh, you can go check it out. Um, this is the, about as simple as you can get and evolve a robot to distinguish between self and non-self. How did they do that in this case? We now have a robot that is stationary at the bottom center of the screen. It doesn't move. It has a little arm, and at the end of that arm is this little circular hand. And now it has two motor neurons which push and pull on this arm. They pull the arm left or right, and the arm rotates in front of the robot. This robot has seven proximity sensors, like we saw before. And as the arm sweeps in front of the robot's field of view, the hand can obstruct its vision. 
So in this particular picture here, uh, it's obstructing a couple of uh, it's a couple of its proximity sensors. While the robot is waving its hand in front of its field of view, we're going to drop a single object from the top of the screen. And that object can fall straight down, or it can fall at various diagonals, represented by the dashed straight black arrow here. The goal that we're going to evolve this robot, the task we're going to evolve this robot to do, is to quote unquote catch the object. We're going to drop these objects in such a way that as they fall, they're going to touch this, uh, this imaginary circumference around the robot. So basically, they're going to pass within, quote unquote, within reach of the robot. You can probably guess what the robot is supposed to do. It should rotate its hand so that the hand comes into contact with the object. The robot is going to, quote unquote, grab the object. Make sense? OK. All right, uh, so I'm sorry, there should be a P equals here. So again, we're going to evaluate each CTRNN during evolution, num trials of times, and we're going to compute the average performance of each CTRNN. That average is going to be a sum, uh, an average of P sub I, which is the performance of a given CTRNN during the ith trial. There was another uh, mistake in this paper. The max should actually be a min. We have one minus a bunch of stuff that includes theta sub i. Forget about the, the other stuff for a moment. Let's just look at one minus theta sub i. Theta sub i is going to be the angular difference now between the angle of the arm and where the object actually hits. So if the object hits front left, and the arm is front left, the angular difference between where the object came close to the robot and where the hand is, is zero. If the object uh, falls and hits front left of the robot and the arm is all the way to the right, large angular distance, one minus theta. The fact that theta lies to the right-hand side of the minus sign should remind us that this fitness function is going to evolve CTRNNs that minimize this penalty. We want ang uh, theta sub i to be as close to zero as possible. Make sense? OK. We don't have to talk about the rest of this. This is just a little bit of a normalization term. doesn't matter for our purposes. So we're evolving CTRNNs to minimize angular error. In other words, catch the block. Everybody see that? OK, so as always, they run evolution, they run evolution, they get, uh, they evolve a CTRNN that successfully catches the block. They take that best evolved CTRNN and then play it back many, many, many times. They drop this large object from above, starting at various positions at the top of the screen, falling at different angles, but all chosen so that the object hits somewhere along this curved, uh, dashed uh, arc. And then they plotted the results. On the horizontal axis here, this is the final object error. So did the, uh, did the object hit minus pi over 8 radians to the front and left of the robot? Or did the object hit plus pi over 8 radians front right of the robot? Or did the object hit directly in front of the robot? Everybody see that? So the horizontal axis is telling you something about the falling object. The vertical axis is reporting the angle of the arm. How did this particular evolved CTRNN do? Is it optimal? Did it do exactly the right thing every time? No. No, right? If it did, we would have a perfectly diagonal line. Remember these little, uh, these little vertical lines here? These are error bars showing, on average, this is what the robot did. So can the arm only catch at the end of the arm at that point, or can it catch kind of anywhere along the arm? Yeah, it, uh, it's got to be the hand. The hand has to catch. So the small black circle has to lie directly over the big black circle when the big black circle hits this arc. That's catching the object. When that happens, that would be a point that lies exactly on the diagonal here. So if the robots, yeah, question? Uh, could it be a sensor limitation or mechanical limitation that's causing this not being straight line? 
Great question. Is it a mechanical limitation here, a limitation of the sensors? What do you think, given what, what we've talked about so far for this agent? Yeah, good point. So I think you're, you're partially right. You can see out here on the edges that the means, the small, the, the dots here are pretty far from the theoretical optimal, which is the dashed gray line. So it's having a problem when the, uh, when the object hits just as far to the left of the robot that it can possibly catch it, or as far to the right as it can possibly catch it. Maybe that's a sensor limitation. Maybe, or it could be what we saw before, it just maybe never saw those conditions during evolution. What else does it seem to have a problem with? Oh, it's right above the object. Yeah, so when the object hits directly above the robot, it should just reach directly up and grab it. it, has a hard time with that, which is again, probably a reminder that it's the same situation we saw in the previous case. Maybe it just never saw that during evolution. Okay, but generally speaking, it's doing more or less the right thing. Okay, so have a look at figure seven here. This one is probably the most challenging one to interpret. Uh, I always get this wrong, so I'm gonna take my time. Here we go. Let's start at the bottom of this figure here. The angle here, you can notice this is an arc plot. At the bottom of this arc plot here, all of the lines are converging to an angular position of zero up here. They're all coming to zero. What this is reporting is the angular position of the arm. Okay, so the horizontal position of each point in these trajectories represents the angle of the arm. Trajectories that are far over here to the left, that represents the arm that is waggling back and forth to the left and lines that are over here to the right represent the arm waggling back and forth uh, on the right side of the robot. You can see that whatever it's doing at the end, the arm is converging on an angular position of zero. This represents, again, multiple playbacks of the same evolved C tier and N. In all these conditions, they're gonna drop the, they're gonna drop the uh, object from different positions at the top of the screen, different horizontal positions at the top of the screen. And all those objects are gonna to fall towards the robot, but land or hit this arc directly above the robot. So we can see immediately whatever's going on, right at the end, the robot reaches up and puts its arm vertically and quote unquote catches the object, which hit just above or passed just directly above the robot. So far, so good? Okay, so as I mentioned, the arm is waggling. So the horizontal position of these trajectories is, is representing the angle of the arm. The color of these lines is representing, the color, or sorry, the grayscale is representing where at the top of the screen was the object dropped. So uh, black, black trajectories represent objects that were dropped above and to the left of the agent. And light gray represents objects that were dropped, uh, that were dropped above and to the right of the robot. Let's start over here. Uh, what happens, uh, uh, what's happening in these cases where the object is dropped above and to the right of the agent? What is the arm doing in these cases? So we've got a whole bunch of trajectories that start up here, and we have a whole bunch of trajectories that start up here. What are these two groups of trajectories representing? How is the robot starting when we drop the objects from the top of the screen? I wish these researchers had made a few animations of what's going on. This would have made things a lot easier <laughs> to build up this mental picture of what's going on. Moving its arm back and forth as the object comes closer. 
So absolutely, so these waggling lines back and forth represent changes in the angular position of the arm. It's waving back and forth. But what do these two bunches at the top represent? The, the grayscale of the trajectory, light gray represents objects that are dropped uh, top right, and black represent objects that are dropped top left. What do the two groups represent? That's exactly what these two groups represent. So the angular, uh, the angular position of the arm in these sets of trajectories, the arm was rotated all the way to the left at the beginning of the simulation and then released, and then the CTRNN controlled the arm. In this second set of cases, the arm was dragged all the way to the right, released, and then the CTRNN could control the arm. Everybody see that? What happens in both cases, when the robot's arm starts at the left and when the robot's arm starts at the right, what happens in both cases? Absolutely, so both cases it's sweeping even further to the left and then back, and then whatever it's doing, it's waving its arm back and forth. Let's follow one of these trajectories. Let's start up here in the upper right. So we drag the robot's arm all the way to the right and then let's follow one of the light gray trajectories that represents the object being dropped from the top right of the screen. Let's follow that trajectory. The object starts falling from the top right. The arm is dragged all the way to the right. It sweeps almost to the midline, almost to zero, then sweeps back again and sweeps over here. Then the arm goes all the way to the right and is shaking back and forth to the right as the object is falling from top right towards the vertical midline of the robot. And just at the last moment, the arm comes vertical and catches the object. Let's follow one more trajectory. Let's go back up here to the right. So we're dragging the arm all the way to the right. We're gonna replay the same evolved CTRNN. Now we're gonna follow one of the dark gray trajectories. This corresponds to the, ar the arm to the right, and the dark gray means that we dropped the object top left. In this case, the minute we release the arm and the CTRNN takes control of the arm, the arm sweeps again towards the left, almost to the midline, sweeps back, and now the arm moves across the center of the field of view of the robot to the left side, and now the arm starts to waggle all the way to the left, stays far left until the last moment it brings the arm back to the vertical and catches the object. Everybody see that now? Okay. How is the robot solving this problem? How is it solving the self non-self discrimination problem, which is where we started? The robot is simultaneously seeing the object and its hand, right? Like all of us, we see ourselves or parts of ourselves throughout the day. And luckily, early on, we learned to distinguish this stuff from all the rest of this stuff. How did the robot evolve to distinguish between these things? Uh, so two questions. Are, are the sensors stationary? Uh, the sensors, yes, I'm sorry. The, sta the sensors are stationary. The robot is stationary. The only thing that moves is the hand in front of the robot's field of view. And I think the robot's moving the hand away from The robot moves its hand way to the left or way to the right so that it doesn't see itself anymore and is only looking at the object. Thank goodness, evolution came up with a blindingly intuitive solution. Makes sense, we're done, we can move on, right? Oh, come on, you're all primed by now. What else is happening? It's not that easy, it's never that easy. What's, what else is that? Some of the time it does that. What else does it do? It seems like some of the time it maybe picks two sensors to bounce the same position to. Maybe. So there are these trajectories inside towards the vertical, the vertical of the cone, where it's waving its arms clearly in its own field of view. And some of these are light gray 
uh, trajectories, meaning it's waving its hand actually directly in front of the object. Seems like the worst thing you could do if you're trying to distinguish between what's out there and yourself. Better to get yourself out of the way and see everything else. Is it not reading its position of its hand mechanically, or is it physically seeing it? Yeah, it, it, uh, good point. So there's no proprioceptive sensor here. It doesn't know the angle of its own uh, shoulder. All it gets are these seven numbers, right? So again, who knows what it's doing? In some cases, it's moving its arm completely out of the way and quote unquote seeing. Maybe in other cases, it's waving its hand just in front of a couple sensors. Maybe it's trying to localize sensory stimulation to see if it can distinguish between hand and object. It's got to be able to quote unquote see the object because it's got to predict where the object is going to hit so it can get its arm there. Whatever it's doing, as usual, the answer is it's complicated. Okay, I think we, we got time to do the third case here. Another important aspect of cognition is, of course, memory, short-term and long-term. We're going to focus on short-term memory in this case. We're going to come back to our Space Invaders robot. It's got seven proximity sensors, like before. It's got two rockets, two motor neurons that push the robot left and right along the bottom of the screen. The trick, or the twist, in this experiment is that the moment the robot moves, it goes blind. All seven sensors turn off. So the dashed gray lines here are meant to represent that fact. The robot can see until it starts moving. It's going to have to start moving because the objects can fall straight down, they can fall at an angle, and the robot is going to have to capture them. The robot is going to have to minimize D sub i in this case. Minimize the distance between itself and the object when the object gets to a height of zero. When the object hits the ground, the agent better be there to catch it. Okay. Evolve, 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 evolve. Get back the most fit, the best C tier and N. And we're going to play that C tier and N back multiple times here. And in this case, we're going, to use the, we're going to use final object position for the horizontal axis. So where on the ground did the object hit? Did the object hit minus 40, representing bottom left of the screen? Did the object hit, sorry, minus 50? Did the object hit plus 50? Did it hit bottom right of the screen? Final object position of zero means the object hit the bottom center of the screen. So far, so good. The vertical axis represents the, uh, the, horizon the final horizontal position of the agent. Where was the agent on the bottom of the screen when the object hit the bottom of the screen? How did this evolved C, T, R, and N do? Is it optimal? It's not optimal. You would, in optimal, you would expect the final agent position to always be exactly equal to the final object position. Everything would line up exactly on the diagonal. The object hits plus 30, the agent is at plus 30. The object hits minus 20, the agent is at minus 20. Where is the robot having trouble? Close to the origin. So these are cases where wherever we drop the object from the top of the screen, the object hit bottom center. And the agent sometimes was there. But if the object hit a little bit off center, the, the agent actually stayed in the center or was at the center. Where else did it have problems? At the, at the extrema, right? When the object hit all the way at the left, bottom left of the screen or all the way at the bottom right of the screen. Okay, let's again dive into uh, a more detailed analysis of this one evolved C tier and N. We're gonna drop, uh, we're gonna replay this C tier and N one, two, three, four, five, about a dozen times. In all of these cases, we're gonna drop the object 
either from top left, somewhere near the center, or somewhere near the top right of the screen. And the initial vertical lines emanating downward are representing the fact that these objects are falling straight down. So we're going to drop the object from different horizontal positions at the top of the screen, but we're going to drop them all so that they're falling directly vertically downward. The, uh, the horizontal axis here is going to represent the horizontal position between the agent and the object. So a horizontal position of zero, uh, a horizontal position of zero means the agent is right at the bottom center of the screen, and vertical position is the height of the object. How did the evolved CTRNN solve this task in this case? What is the agent doing in these 12 or so trials where the object starts falling directly downward? What do the diagonal lines represent? What's happening at those moments in time where the, where the trajectories are diagonal? Remember, the objects are falling straight down. Apart from the robots moving in the circular direction, the underneath will um, be the falling object. That's right. So it's, that's, the, that's the agent moving horizontally. And all of these diagonal lines are pointing in towards uh, a horizontal uh, position of zero. This is the object, the agent moving towards the object. What is, the, what is the situation for the agent during this movement period? Seems like the agent only tries to move one time and then just moves around. Yep. Okay. Remember that the minute that the agent starts moving, it goes blind. For this evolved, this evolved CTRNN hit on a particular solution where it moves the agent at a constant speed, at a constant velocity. There's no curves in these trajectories. It's moving at a constant speed to get it to underneath the object just in time. What's going on here? How does the, ob how does the agent know to be in the right place at the right time if the moment it starts moving, it can't see the object anymore? Yep. It uh, kind of like learns to move in a specific like increment. Okay. So that must be like enough distance to make a difference, but still not take up too much time. So it can relearn from its new position. Okay, I, we got part of the solution there. Did it learn that when the when it moves to zero, it has the most success? Uh, it's evolved. It's evolved that case. Now whether it knows that or not, who knows, right? Remember, the agent cannot detect fitness points. It can't detect. All it can detect are these seven numbers. So it's evolved to always be directly under the object when the object hits, right? So it's getting high fitness. It's doing the right thing. But what strategy did the CTRNN evolve to embody? Maybe it waited until the object had hit the last sensor and then gone to a constant speed that would know to get to it the last time. OK, so these sensors have a constant. They're, they're not infinite, right? These rays have a certain distance. So it looks like maybe the strategy is the moment that the object hits one of the outermost sensors or some sensor at that time, start moving either left or right at a constant velocity. You'll notice that the vertical components of each of these trajectories, some vertical components are longer than others. So the CTRNN is causing the robot to stay still for different amounts of time and then releasing, right? Oh, nice, very intuitive solution, right? If you're going to go blind the moment you start moving, then learn about your world. OK, these objects always fall vertically at different distances from me. And I'll wait. I'll wait until they're at a certain angle from me based on my sensors. And then I'll just always move at the same speed. And I'll get exactly where I need to be at the right time. I will leave you with that cliffhanger. You have a quiz due uh, tonight. You're working on assignment five. Have a great rest of your week.
See you on Tuesday.